assalamu alaikum and we are meeting again for lecture 5 of drama 2 that is modern drama um, if I quickly um, refresh your memories about lecture 4 in lecture 4 we started with the plot overview of um, the play the doll's house by Henrik Ibsen um, we quickly went through the plot we understood the story how the events are connected uh, what kind of events are described in the drama and um, what kind of development drama has. Um, then to forward our understanding we started with the character analysis and we went through all the characters precisely however uh, we started with an in-depth analysis of the few characters which are major characters and we happen to cover the very first major characters who is also the protagonist of the drama Nora Helmer in lecture 4 now in lecture 5 we are continuing with this character analysis and the very first character that we are going to talk about today is Torvald Helmer who is Nora's husband in this drama in the doll's house um, Torvald Helmer is a, is a very interesting character of the drama and basically as we were discussing in the last lecture that all the characters in the drama do play some doll-like qualities. Secondly, these characters are not only characters who are, um, who are personalities as, as individuals but also they are representing some kind of um, a vision of the society um, they belong to. Torvald embraces the belief that a man's role in marriage is to protect and guide his wife. Ibsen's work, The Doll's House, is a masterpiece not only for the reason, for many other reasons, but for this one reason that in this drama he closely observes and presents the problem and issues related to the institution of marriage. And the one aspect of this institution that Ibsen presents is the dominating role of one partner. And that is what Ibsen supports as well that in marriage institution it's a, it's a, uh, it's a bond between two partners. So both of them should have equal status and should um, decide about their lives freely. They should have freedom. So what Ibsen shows here, uh, understanding his feministic approach, um, he shows a husband who is authoritative. He is authoritative not only um, in his professional life, working, who is working at bank, but also authoritative at home too. And uh, he's playing a role who would like to protect and guide his wife all the time, no matter whether she wants it or not whether she likes it or not now when he is over protecting and over guiding his wife we see Torvald Helmer playing a role of a father like figure towards his wife um, now I want you since now you are done with your uh, detailed reading of the drama I would want you to note down these points and try to um, collect evidence from your reading any evidence which you think would go with this point should be there in your notebook so when I say that um, Torvald Helmer's character um, is found portraying role of a man who would like to be a father-like figure to his wife. If you find any incident, any dialogue that substantiate, um, that supports this idea, you need to collect it in your notebook. That will not able, that will not able only, uh, that will enable you to understand uh, what is the depth of this idea, but also will enable you to substantiate whenever you are making this state statement. Now, how do we find him uh, portraying this father-like figure? He overguides and instructs her with tride. Moralistic, moralistic sayings such as, a home that depends on loan and debt is not beautiful because it is not free. 
and that is what he's telling um, Nora when he comes to know about that Nora um, has taken a loan from the bank. So, um, and then at the same time, we see Tauber's kind of hypocrite nature, who talks about beauty, who talks about freedom all the time, but is he himself beautiful? And here I'm not talking about the physical beauty, I'm talking about the beauty inside you, the beauty that you share with your relations, the beauty of, um, of, of truth that you would like to convey and you would like to see in the society. Um, we find Torvald a prisoner of beauty. He's not the one who, uh, who is demanding beauty um, as a natural aspect of life. He is a prisoner of beauty who just cannot bear with any ugliness of life, whether it's an ugliness of, of, of a relation, ugliness of life, ugliness of um, any social issues and problems which are taking place, like we see um, Dr. Rank's disease. Dr. Ranks uh, finds himself unable to disclose the secret to his dear friend that he's close to death because he finds that um, Torvald may not be able to um, digest this ugliness of life. So is he beautiful enough to demand beauty of life? And when he talks about freedom, what kind of freedom he, um, he supports? what kind of freedom he gives to his relations, he gives to society where, where he moves. Alright, then we see that he is also eager to teach Nora, teach Nora about everything. Not about the things that he thinks he is better in, but also about the things that Nora can do better than him, being a woman. Nora, he teaches Nora dance. The dance she performs at the costume party, Torvald likes to envision himself as Nora's survivor. Um, so he thinks all the time he's directing her, he's giving her instructions, feeling um, and making her feel and realize that she's not doing good and she cannot do good unless Torvald comes in as his um, guide. And he also sees that he is Nora's survivor. He wants to save her. He wants to protect her and overprotect her. And that he very much portrays um, in one of his dialogues when he say that he says that, "Do you know that I've often wished you were facing some terrible dangers so that I could risk life and limb, risk everything for your sake." So we see what no what. Torvald imagines here. Torvald imagines himself as like a superman, as like a man who keeps all the power and who keeps all the authority and who can save lives and particularly life of a woman who he thinks the poor chap cannot help herself. This was Torvald's relation toward um, the, the opposite gender uh, towards the opposite gender and particularly to Nora um, in a capacity of a husband where he treats her like a father. Now we see what is Torvald's relation towards society. How does he enjoy this relation? Um, although Torvald seizes the power in his relationship with Nora and refers to her as a girl um, towards the end after their um, uh, after the dispute um, and the conversation based on that, it seems that Torvald is actually the weaker and more childlike character. So you find that um, when Nora reveals this to Torvald, that um, through the letter when, when Torvald comes to know about the Nora secret, he gets very angry. He gets angry to the extent that he says anything whatever comes in his mouth no matter how hurting it is and he's telling um, the mother of his children who spent eight years with um, him in all uh, thick and thin. She um, has been um, a supportive strong hand uh, for Torvald even in his um, uh, sick days. She was the one who managed to 
um, help him, um, you know, uh, move to Italy. But forgetting everything, forgetting how um, happy, how supportive wife she is, um, how kind mother she has been, she says all the hurting um, things that, uh, he says all the hurting things that he could do. And he says that you're not, you're a hypocrite, you're a liar, and you are, you should not be allowed to raise our children anymore. So, this shows that he's a weak personality and he himself is a childlike personality who does not have any control over his emotions. We find that children, um, they are innocent. So, whenever they find something frightening, they'll get scared. Whenever they'll find something pleasant, they'll, 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 show, you, they'll show their pleasure. Whenever they find something new, they will unconsciously um, show you a surprise on their face with eyes wide open, right? So this is a childlike emotion that you do not have a control over your emotions and you cannot tame them. However, by the passage of time, when you grow up, you learn to control and tame your emotions. You learn where to show your emotions and where not to show. But we see the tall world at this age being this responsible, who is a married person and who is a father as well, is not able to control his emotions. Um, then we find Dr. Rank's explanation for not wanting Torvald to enter his sick room. Torvald is so fastidious, he cannot face up to anything ugly. Suggests that Dr. Rank feels Torvald must be sheltered like a child from the realities of the world. So we see that Dr. Rank is not only afraid of um, telling and revealing the secret of, her, of his disease to Torvald, but he's also very much scared of sharing anything about her sickness with his dear friend for the reason that Torvald will not be able to um, take this ugliness of life that a man can get sick and the man can get die. This is the, the kind of attitude that um, Ibsen wants to um, convey to audience that seeing the ugliness in, ugliness in the society, there were two kind of attitudes. One was that people will get very sensitive towards those, um, those evidences of life and they will get sensitive and they will feel the pain. And the other category is um, which would become indifferent, which would like to close their eyes towards reality and would like to fascinate about the beauties of life. So somehow we find that Torvald belongs to that other category who would like to close their eyes towards the ugliness of um, real life. Um, furthermore, um, Torvald reveals himself to be childishly petty at times. His real objection to working with Crockstead stems not from um, deficiencies in Crockstead's character, moral character, but rather Crockstead's overly friendly and familiar behavior. We find Torvald's insecure self somewhere here. We got to know that Crockstead is not only a low-level employee at bank where um, Torvald keeps an authoritative position, um, but they, they, they have also been together since their childhood because they were school fellows. They were f they, if they were not friends at school, they were, uh, they were at least fellows who went together to a school. So we see that there's a kind of familiarity that they both share. So we got to know towards the end when Torvald um, being pressed hard from his wife shares this with Nora that it's not only that Crockstead's moral character is a problem for me and I am dismissing him for this reason. Um, however, what I am not comfortable with is overly friendly behavior. Torvald feels disrespected somehow because he thinks I am the one who keeps authority. I am the one who is at higher position and higher level than Crockstead. So how can Crockstead 
can show any kind of relation with me, no matter if it is an only an overly friendly behavior. And the reason we know that, the background of the reason is that they have been um, school fellows. So, we find Torvald um, being insecure over here and um, probably he cares more about his reputation than um, then he would care about any person's moral um, doing towards his job or um, responsibility. Um, Tower's decision to fire Crockstead stems ultimately from the fact that he feels threatened and offended by Crockstead's failure to pay him the proper respect. Right? So it's not only um, his being annoyed with Crockstead's moral attitude, he's being insecure, he feels threatened and he feels disrespected and he feels that it's a challenge to his reputation that he keeps in, in front of society. Torvald is very conscious of other people's uh, perception of him and of his standing in the community and that is what we see not only in Crockstead's case but in Nora's case too when he gets to know that Nora has borrowed a loan from bank and it's a kind of illegal loan the very first thought that comes to his mind is that what will people think about me and that is why he calls her um, someone who has ruined his happiness here he's not thinking about any other thing and that becomes very much evident when we find when we find um, Torvald in the very next scene when he receives letter from Crockstead where he returns him the um, uh, what do you call that the contract with the signature um, and he finds himself very happy and he altogether suddenly changes tone with Nora however we find that Nora is not very comfortable in letting everything go at that point. Okay, so then we find that Hicks, uh, Torvald's explanation for rejecting Nora's request that Crockstead be kept on at the office, that retraining Crockstead would make him a laughing stock before the entire staff, shows that he prioritized his reputation over his wife's desire. So his rejection of listening to Nora's request is not only for all the reasons that we have discussed so far. We need to, we need to see here that um, it's not that he's rejecting the request for the, for the reasons and rationales that he keeps of uh, Crockstead being um, disrespectful, Crockstead being um, morally sick, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but one thing that he's rejecting, he's rejecting Nora's request. Nora whose dear wife to Torburn. That, that is what he shows in the very beginning that Nora is very dear wife to um, him. However, we find that he cruelly and plainly refuses um, his wife's request. So, saying that I love you or saying that you are dear to me is not that uh, would mean equally then telling the other person by your actions that you really care for that person. So we find Torvald, um, there's a difference between what he says and what he does. So he's a man of words, but he may not be man of actions. Okay, moving on. Further we find that Torvald demonstrates his deep need for society's respect in his reaction to Nora's deception. We already discussed this point, so we will move on. Although he says that Nora has ruined his happiness and will not be allowed to raise the children, he insists that she remains in the house not because any other reason, because this may not be acceptable in the society and this may be a kind of... Um, this may bring a kind of bad name to Torvald that his wife left him. His chief concern is saving the appearance of their household, saving the appearance of their married life. Because when husband and wife, they get separated, um, it's a kind of, um, it brings a bad name to the family that um, two of these 
people, they could not go along each other and they could not compromise, they could not absorb each other's, um, uh, you know, um, things that are not liked by them. Because when two people get together, it's not always a happy combination. Um, there are many things that um, each of the partners, they have to absorb, they have to compromise with. And this shows the depth of one's personality. So if you're not able to do that, it shows that, um, it shows the maturity level that you keep. How compromising, how compatible you are towards human beings. So, um, at the place end, his wife, Nora Helmer, um, abandons him. She leaves, she leaves him, um, leaving behind her three young children as well. Um, I would invite you here to think about Nora's agony. Um, a mother may not like, in any situation, may not like to leave her children. So if Nora is leaving her children and her household and her husband, a woman is leaving her husband uh, who has all her life been um, relying on him for everything, almost everything, literally everything. So what kind of situation and mental um, situation she would have gone through? I want you to think about it. She claims that she does not love him. She can no longer be his wife. He begs her to stay, yet Nora denies him. Walking off in the middle of the winter night, slamming the door behind her. This action shows the determination in Nora's character. Determination of when she thinks about something and when she makes her decision, she materializes that decision knowing that this may bring consequences that will be very hard for her, but she keeps on with them. So, what kind of character is being portrayed of Nora as well as of Torval, that is for you to understand and produce. Okay. Um, what we see here, when the curtain closes upon a pathetic, defeated husband, it's the, it's the, the last um, scene, the last act is taking place in the last scene of the act when Nora slams the door behind her and she walks away. Now the curtains are, uh, the curtain, curtain closes and we see a defeated, a left alone husband. Some viewers find that Torvald has received his um, reward of being evil to his wife. Torvald, Torvald's um, demeaning personality and his um, hypocritical actions justify Nora's harsh decision to leave him. Some audience, um, one category of audience would say that, yes, Torvald deserved it. Nora did very right by leaving him. However, the other kind of audience would say, no, um, Nora shouldn't leave her husband at this stage. If he's being immature, Nora being wife, Nora being um, an intelligent woman, should go along with her husband and should give him a chance. Um, you know, um, now when he's begging her and he is re requesting her to stay, she should have stayed. If not for her husband, now the third category is uh, who's saying she should have say, stayed. They say that if she should have stayed, if not for her husband, at least for her children. So we have different viewpoints here and I would want you to determine um, your own viewpoint. However, substantiate it, support it with evidence and with discussion. Um, there's one very interesting thing about literature is that no one is wrong. Everyone is right because that is how you are seeing the reality described on the screen, on the pages. So what you will be thinking um, can never be wrong. However, you have to support your thinking with the evidence from the drama and then with your discussion. Um, supporting what your statement is and supporting that how do you reach this conclusion. I hope that you understand me. Okay, moving on with it. Upon seeing a production of Henrik Ibsen's A Dollhouse 
audiences are left with an, with an important question. This was not only a drama. This was a landmark of its own time. This was a masterpiece of Ibsen, not for the type of characters that he presents, not for the type of story that he presents, but the type of reflection of the society that he brings forward. So the question is left with audiences. Should we feel sorry for Torvald Helmer or should we feel sorry for Nora Helmer? So who do you feel sorry about and why? Explain your support, your answer with evidences and discussion. So this can be one of the questions you can be assessed for. So be ready for it. Moving on. Um, although we analyzed that Torvald has so many different angles of his personality. However, there are three things that you need to keep in your mind. Um, and I would want you to analyze the character keeping th three dimensions active. One is that he talks sweet all the time. He is a very sweet talker. He would be very sweet with his wife. He would be very sweet with his colleagues. He would be very sweet with everyone who would whosoever would come over. But is he sweet inside? Or is it what his behavior is like in real? Then what is his character and what is, what, what is the kind of relationship that he keeps up with Nora? The second dimension. Third, is he an egoist, egoistic man? Does he care for his ego? Um, we need to think about it. So let's have a close look. Torvald Helmer possesses many obvious flaws. For one, he constantly talks down to his wife. Here is a list of his pet names for Nora. He has so many pet names for Nora. My little skylark, my little squirrel, my little singing bird, my pretty little pet, my little sweet tooth, my poor little Nora. Well, calling somebody with um, love names is not a bad thing, is not a flaw. However, what kind of, na what kind of names you are calling someone with? can be a concern. My little Skylark, okay fine, here we think that um, Torvald relates Nora um, quality of singing um, and call her a name, okay fine. My little squirrel, squirrel can be a symbol here. What kind of symbol it is? You need to think about it. My little singing bird, my little singing bird. This little is again symbolic use of language. My pretty little pet, pet, needs your attention. My little sweet tooth, we got to know that Nora would like eating a few things. However, Torvald will not like her to eat them. Now, um, whether it's an ironic use of noun here, or he really means calling her little sweet tooth out of his love for Nora? That's another question. My poor little Nora. My poor little Nora. What do you mean by that? So I would want you to think about these names. Think them symbolically. Look at the kind of language being used. Look at the word little. Look at the word my. A constant repetition of my. Look at these symbols of squirrel, singing bird, pet, sweet tooth, and poor. And think, how will you like to understand Torvald's character by the usage of name that he keeps up with for Nora throughout the play? Notice with every term of endearment, the word little is always included, as I mentioned. Torvald views himself as the emotional and intellectual superior of the household. To him, Nora is a child wife, someone to watch over, to instruct, to guide, um, nurture, and care and protect. He never considers her an equal partner in the relationship. Of course, there is mar their marriage is one typical of 18th century 
Europe manages and Ibsen uses his play to challenge this status quo. This um, prevailing ill of the society of that time. Now, what is his relation with Nora? How does he keep up with his uh, relationship with Nora? To Tom's credit, Nora is a willing participant in their um, dysfunctional relationship. She understands that her husband sees her as an innocent, childlike persona and she struggles to maintain the facade. That is very important. We would see, as I discussed in my last lecture, that it's not only the person if he keeps up some certain kind of behavior with you it's you giving him or her the liberty of maintaining that behavior with you so if Torvald treats Nora as childlike okay that's how he treats her but it is Nora who gives him the liberty and the space to keep on treating her child like childlike Nora uses the pet names whenever she tries to persuade her husband. Now this is Nora's character. If a little squirrel were to ask every so nicely, so she tries to use the same kind of words that Torvald likes using for her and tries to get back on her husband when she needs to request something. Um, she puts away her swing needles and um, unfinished dress because she knows that her husband does not wish to see a woman toiling away. He wishes to see only the final beautiful product. In addition, Nora keeps secret from her husband. So her husband um, would not want her wife indulged in things and would not want to see her uh, his wife um, half made up. He would like to see her made up for him all the time and completely made up. So if, he ha if she has to do some work or if, ha if she has to do something related to household, she should do it in his absence. She goes behind his back to obtain her ill-gotten loan. Torvald is too stubborn to ever borrow money, even at the cost of his own life. Essentially, Nora saves Torvald by borrowing the money so that they can travel to Italy until her husband's health improves. Okay, we discussed all these points. Um, throughout the play, Torvald is oblivious to his wife's craftiness and her compassion. When he discovers the truth at the end, he is outraged when he should be humbled. We find that there are many things that Nora has done for her husband. So instead of being humble and thankful, Torvald gets outraged. What kind of attitude is that? And what are the evidences that we receive from the script? You are responsible to note them down. This will help you draw the character, the both of these characters. What I'm helping you here, I'm helping you here by pointing some evidences, strong evidences in black and white from the script. So let's have a look at Torvald's ego. What evidences do we have regarding it? Perhaps Torvald's most dislikable quality is his is hypocrisy. Many times throughout the play, Torvald criticizes the morality of other, other characters. He trashes the repetition of Crockstead's one of his lesser employees and ironically the loan shark that Nora is indebted to. We find that Torvald is criticizing other characters for their ego and their attitude. However, what kind of ego and attitude he keeps is a question. He um, speculates that Crockstead's corruption, uh, we are talking about Crockstead, uh, Torvald here, probably started in the home. Um, belie Torvald believes that if the mother of a household is dishonest, then surely the children will become morally infected. Torvald also complains about Nora's late father. When Torvald learns that Nora has committed forgery, illegal use of signature, someone's copying someone's signature, 
he blames her crime as her father's weak morals this is this shows us another aspect of tower's personality where he's blaming nora's father for what nora has done no matter we are not discussing here whether what nora has done is right or wrong or for for what good reason nora has done um this and that we are discussing that um torvald is blaming nora's dead father for nora's action so how true he is in um his accusation how true in he is in his perception you are to answer it okay yet for all his self righteousness torvald is a hypocrite in the beginning of act 3 after dancing and having a um, merry time at a holiday party torvald tells nora how much he cares for her he claims to be absolutely devoted her he even wishes that some um someone would help this um couple to come close to each other so that they could demonstrate um the steadfast happy nature of their married life um and he also in his love for his wife he also um expresses his wish of um seeing nora finding nora in some kind of trouble where he jumps in being his survivor so we can see um here we can see torvald love apparent love is influenced by his desire of um finding himself as a survivor and a guide for his wife of course a moment later that wished for conflict arises so what he was wishing for that she finds nora in a kind of terrible situation where her life is at risk and he jumps in to save her this happens in the very next situation when nora's nora is in danger what kind of danger it is his her reputation is at stake her married life is at stake her personality her character's um um presentation is at stake and here nora needs a survivor to jump in and to save her what happens then torvald finds the letter revealing how nora has brought scandal and blackmail into his household nora is in trouble but torvald the supposedly shining white nine who would come to save nora fails to come to her secure instead here is what he yells at her he says now you have ruined my entire happiness and it's all the fault of a feather brained woman and he also says you will not be allowed to bring up the children i can't trust you with them so much for being nora's dependable knight in shining armor so when you claim something you wish for something and when the situation happens to be there this is how you are um showing your true action towards the situation so we find again we would reinforce um there's a a kind of conflict going on between a man of word and man of actions so what kind of person uh, torvald is you are to decide however with evidences and discussion based on that okay then is there any room for pity for this character since we do have different categories of audience um and one category would say that torvald is a poor chap a poor character here who gets more than what he deserved in the end his punishment is too hard for him right so they feel sympathy for this character they feel pity for this character so i invite you to offer your opinion and find out what will you feel about this character and some of the evidences to wait for are despite his many flaws 
some readers and audience members still feel tremendous sympathy for Tobel. In fact, when the play was first performed in Germany and America, the ending was changed. It was believed by some producers that theater goers, people who go to watch some dramas, would not want to see a mother walk out on her husband and children. That is a kind of forbidden thing in that society. How can a mother take such a harsh step? How can a wife leave her husband? So here Ibsen is portraying that male dominating um, role of a husband. So in several revised versions, a doll's house ends with Nora, although reluctantly, however deciding to stay, stay back with her husband. However, in the original classic version, Ibsen does not spare poor Torvald from humiliation. Since when Nora slams the door behind her, it's a kind of act that um, describes what is um, inside. The doors of happiness, as Nora is being his happiness, doors of happiness are closed on Torvald. When Nora calmly says, and this is Nora's monologue, we do have a lot to talk about. That is where Nora is in process of realizing what she has done for her husband, what she has been expecting all her life. Torbert learns that Nora will no longer be his doll or child wife. The kind of attitude that Nora um, shows at that time, let Torbert understand that Nora, that Nora is not a child anymore. He is astounded by her choice of leaving him. He asks for a chance to reconcile their differences. Um, he even, we see that Nora does not go back on her decision. However, Torvald is changing decisions all the time. He even suggests that they live as brother and sister. What kind of relation that would be? Why does Torvald offer such a situation? You need to think about it. So, no matter how hard Torvald requests Nora, Nora refuses to stay back. She feels as though um, Torvald is now a stranger, the one who could not find her true self, who could not um, know her um, in eight years where she has been with him uh, through thick and thin. How can, she, uh, how can he be the one who would know her for her rest of life? So, desperate, Torvald asks if there is the smallest hope that they might be husband and wife once again. She responds, Nora, both you and I would have to change to the point where, oh Torvald, I don't believe in miracles anymore. And Torvald says, but I will believe, name it. Change to the point where, and Nora says, we would make a real marriage of our lives together? Goodbye. Then she promptly leaves. Grief striking, Torbert hides his face in his hands. In the next moment, he lifts his head up, somewhat hopeful, and says, The miracle of miracles? He asks himself, he's questioning himself, and he's hoping that Nora comes back. His longing to redeem their marriage seems sincere. So perhaps despite his hypocrisy, self-righteousness, and his demeaning attitude, the audience may feel sympathy for Torvald as the door slams shut on his tear-stained hopes because somehow it is felt that towards the end when he's requesting and begging Nora to stay, we find that probably he wants to give his married life another chance. And when somebody, somebody is begging for forgiveness, one needs to reconsider. Um, and maybe in this situation where Nora has so much of a stake in this situation, she would have rethought about um, her decision. Anyhow, um, I would like want to see how would you 
um, analyze the situation. So this was all, all about um, Torvald Helmer's character. Now we are going to sink into Nils Korkstedt's character who is playing as apparently playing the role of a, or the role of an antagonist, a villain. But does he remain to be a villain? Or is there any kind of improvement from antagonist to second protagonist? Or does he stay somewhere in between a hero and a villain? You need to um, finalize it. In melodramas, in dramas which are full of emotions of the 18th century, villains wore black caps and laughed men menacingly. Um, you would see this uh, representation of um, um, funny dresses and the funny moustache and a big laughter in our uh, Pakistani local movies, in our Punjabi movies and in our Urdu movies where the hero would keep a weapon in his hand and would um, dress up as an evil person and he would have some kind of evil smile on his face with a moustache and a big mole over here somewhere on his face. Um, and you would see that this character would have a kind of darker complexion. I don't know what it means, whether it is to show his darker self or um, what relation it has with this, its character. Uh, we, Although in modern drama, in modern theater, we do find handsome villains as well. However, the tradition has been that, that a villain would be a kind of ugly man. Oftentimes these um, sinister men would tie um, damsels to railroad tracks or um, threaten to kick old ladies out of their soon-to-be um, foreclosed homes. This is how their reaction uh, and their actions would be. Um, although on the um, diablo uh, di diabolic side, Nils Krokstedt from A Doll's House does not have the same passion for evil as your typical bad guy would have. He seems ruthless at first, but experiences a change of heart early on in Act 3. We find that although he is not l traditional characters and he is not that ugly or he is not that a kind of character who would keep a big moustache or a mole or a certain kind of costume. However, the, the evil thing that is attached with this character is his ruthless heart, his indifferent attitude where he does not care much about things. He does not care uh, threatening Nora. He does not care revealing her truth. Um, what he cares about is securing his position. But if you rethink, why would he want to secure his position? Maybe he is in need. Maybe he has to provide his children bread and butter. Maybe he's, he has to earn for them. So we need to understand the situation to call Crockstead a villain. We need to have strong evidence for it. And then we find a change as well in this character towards um, very early in Act 3. Uh, it's just the, um, uh, the climax where he gets changed. And we find that um, he has a change of heart. The audience is then left to wonder, is Crockstead a villain or is he ultimately a decent guy? That's the question. So, let us have an overview of the character. Um, Crockstead is the antagonist, apparently or really, in a doll's house, but he is not necessarily a villain. Though his willingness to allow Nora's torment to um, continue is cruel, Crockstead is not without sympathy for her. As he says, even money lenders, hacks, well, a man like me, can have a little of what you call feeling, you know. He visits Nora to, to check on her and he discourages her from committing suicide. So this shows us an other side of his character. Is he being kind to Nora? Is he again trying to protect Nora? Does he care if Nora dies? 
or if it's only that he would see her as a last ray of hope to save his position. So, Crockstead has reasonable motives for behaving as he does. He wants to keep his job at the bank in order to spare his children from the hardship that come with a spoiled repetition. When you are thrown out of your position, it's not only causing you, um, you know, um, deprivation of necessities, but also cause you bad reputation. So, um, is, is Crockstead being reasonable when uh, he's insisting Nora to let her, to help, to help him, let him, uh, let him regain his position or he's being cruel? That's a question. Unlike Torvald, who seems to desire respect for selfish reason, Crockstead desired it for his family's sake. So, where will you keep this aspect? In, in the positive aspects of Crockstead's personality or in the negatives? Like Nora, Crockstead is a person who has been wronged by society. And both Nora and Crockstead have committed the same crime, forgery of signature. If Crockstead is blackmailing Nora, Nora has committed a crime too by forging signature. So we sympathize with Nora because we find that she has done this thing to support her husband. But can't we support Crockstead for this act, evil act, where he's threatening Nora? Um, what if he's doing this to um, support his family? So, do we need, does this character need sympathy or we should take him as an evil character? We find Ibsen's sympathy changing sides here. So, it's not that he speaks for women rights. It's not that he's feminist in his approach only. He speaks for human right as well, taking care of all the characters, both the genders. Though he did break the law, Crockstead's crime was relatively minor, but society has saddled him with the stigma of being a criminal and prohibited him from moving beyond his past. Well, we want to sympathize with Nora because what she has done, she has done in her past. And now when she was almost done with um, paying back her loan, um, she should not be punished for that. But what about Crockstead? Yes, Crockstead um, did threaten Nora for helping him. But then later on in Act 3, he changed his heart. And he was uh, willing to take his letter back from the letter box. It was um, Christine who insisted to let the letter be there. So, what should we feel for this character now? Crockstead's claim that his immoral behavior began when Mrs. Lint abandoned him for a man with money. So, see, so she could provide for her family makes it possible for us to understand Crockstead as a victim of circumstances. Now again, if we say that Crockstead was evil in the beginning, what evil was that? He was trying to earn money. The one reason can be that he's trying to earn money to support his family. Okay, it's not that evil a reason. In fact, quite a noble reason. However, if it is a reason that he wants to earn money just for the sake of money, how evil is that? How evil is this reason? Because we find that back in his life, Mrs. Lind, Christine, left Crockstad only for the sake of money. And she married a wealthier man because she thought he'll be in a better position to support her family. So, if keeping this in his heart, Crockstad aimed at earning more money, how evil is that? So, um, I am posing questions to you because I want you to think about them. And not only think about them, but try to answer them. 
One could argue that society forced Mrs. Lent away from Crockstead and thus prompted his crime. Um, so, this can be one valid reason of sympathizing with Crockstead is that what Crockstead, Crockstead has done for money may not be his own um, aspect of his own personality. It, it can be um, an aspect adopted later when Mrs. Um, Lint abandoned um, Crockstead. Well, Crockstead the catalyst. At first it may seem that Crockstead is the play's main antagonist, an evil character. When he is threatening Nora, when he's telling her to do what he wishes to, otherwise he's going to disclose her secret. After all, Nora Helmer is a happy-go-lucky wife. She's been uh, she's been out Christmas shopping for her lovely children. Her husband is just about to receive a raise and a promotion. Everything is going well for her until Crockstead enters the story. So we find Crockstead's character quite evil in the beginning. Then the audience learns that Crockstead, a co-worker of her husband Torbell, has the power to blackmail Nora. And we feel very angry. Why would he do that? She forget. She forged the signature of her dead father when she obtained a loan from him. Unbeconistic to her husband. Well, we find that Nora has, done, has not done a right thing. However, we have a reason to sympathize with her that she has done to save her husband. But how evil an act was that? It was an equal crime. Now, Crockstead wants to secure his position at the bank. If Nora fails to prevent Crockstead from being fired, he will reveal her criminal actions and discredit Torvald's good nature. Well, we find Crockstead again being very bad. We are trying to determine the changes in the plot as well as in the Crockstead's character. When Nora is unable to persuade her husband, Crockstead grows angry and impatient. Throughout the first two acts, Crockstead serves as a catalyst. Basically, he initiates the action of the play. He initiates the conflict, the complexity. He sparks the flames of conflict. And with each unpleasant visit to the Helmer residence, Nora's trouble increases. In fact, she even contemplates suicide as a means of escaping her woes. Crockstead senses her plan and counters it. So there is a change of Crockstead's character. Crockstead, so if you are thinking of trying any desperate measures, if you happen to be thinking of running away, Nora, Nora, which I am, Crockstead, or anything worse, Nora, how did you know I was thinking of that? Crockstead, most of us think of that to begin with. I did too, but I didn't have the courage. Nora, I haven't either. Crockstead, so you haven't the courage either. Um, it would also be very stupid. So in a way, Crockstead is snubbing this idea in Nora's head of committing any, committing suicide or running away from house because he thinks it's a stupid idea. Um, does it show any moral values related to this character? Another question. Crockstead, criminal on the rebound. The more we learn of Crockstead, the more we understand that he shares a great deal with Nora Helmer. There's a kind of similarity between two characters. First of all, both have committed the crime of forgery. Both are criminals. Moreover, their motives were out of a desperate desire to save their loved ones. Crockstead wanted to save his family. Nora wanted to save her family. Also like Nora, Crockstead has 
um, contemplated ending his life to eliminate his trouble. Both wished for a suicide or at least a runaway, but was ultimately too scared to follow that. They did not find courage. Courage to do this, despite being labeled as corrupt and morally sick, Croxted has been trying to lead a legitimate life. He did not become a criminal. He complains for the last 18 months have gone straight. All the time it's been hard going. I was content to work my way up step by step. Then he angrily explains to Nora, don't forget, it's him who is forcing me off the straight and narrow again, you, your own husband. That's something I'll never forgive him for. That means there is a wish, there's a desire deep inside Croxted of keeping himself straight on the way. However, any act like Torvald's act of dismissing him can drag him down to um, do, do, of doing what? What he does not wish to do. Although at times Croxted is vicious, his motivation is for his motherless children, thus casting a slightly sympathetic light on his character. So what is that change of heart that we see in Croxted's character? One of the surprises of this play is that Croxted is not really the central antagonist. In the end, that prestige belongs to Torvald Helmer. So how does this transition occur? That husband of the protagonist who apparently was quite a normal character, a happy character, a character uh, who keeps a lot of praise from society, who keeps a lot of agreeable characteristics, changes his role to be uh, an antagonist. And the apparently antagonist changes to be a kind of good guy. Near the beginning of Act 3, Croxted has an earnest conversation with his lost love, Christine, the widow. They reconcile and once their romance, or at least their admirable feeling for each other, are um, they felt reunited, Croxted no longer wants to deal with blackmail and um, the kind of uh, ugly attitude that he was keeping up with Nora. He's a changed man, although here Christine insisted him to keep up with that. He asked Mrs. Lind if he should tear up the revealing letter that was intended for Torvald's eyes. Surprisingly, Mrs. Lind decides that he should leave it in the mailbox so that Nora and Torvald can finally have an honest discussion about things. Is Christine being disloyal to her friend? Is Christine being um, an evil character? who wishes to damage her friend or is Christine being um, a kind of real protecting figure who would want Nora and her husband to di discuss this threatening thing um, in their life to be over with it and to get into a real relation where Nora should not feel insecure all the time. So what would you say about it? He agrees to this, but minutes later he chooses to drop off a second letter explaining that their secret is safe and that the um, IOU is theirs to dispose. Now, what kind of gesture is that? Probably Croxted knows Torvald a lot, not only being his um, employee, but being his school fellow he knows Torvald's nature, so he writes a letter to help Nora save her position, telling that Torvald should not worry about the secret being disclosed, it is saved, and that he is destroying um, any evidences with him and is willing to hand over, in fact giving back the evidence to the family. 
Now, is this sudden change of heart realistic? Perhaps the redemption, redemptive action is too convenient. Perhaps Stockstead's change does not ring true to human nature. However, Crockstead occasionally lets his compassion shine through his bitterness. So perhaps playwright Henrik Ibsen provides enough hints in the first two acts to convince us that all Crockstead really needed was someone like Mrs. Lind to love and admire him. In the end, Nora and Torvald's relationship is sweared, yet Crockstead begins a new life with the women he believed had left him forever. So, today what we did, we analyzed two of these major characters. We analyzed Torvald Helmer and we analyzed Crockstead, Nils Crockstead. So, so far we had um, um, a depth analysis of, a deep analysis of, in-depth analysis of Tomilt Helmer's character, Crockstead's character and Nora Helmer's character. So, for, so far I guess things are quite clear to you and um, you are ready to start up with your discussions and to do your very first quiz um, after the next lecture. But I'll continue with um, I'll continue with the Dr. Rang's character analysis with you and Mrs. Christine Lin's character. So the sixth char character will not only continue with the, the major analysis, analysis of these major characters, it will also touch upon the themes uh, represented in the play and the motives which were used in the play to develop these themes. So for this lecture, um, um, this was um, the last bit of talk. Now I will see you in the next lecture, inshallah, in lecture 6. Bye then. Allah Hafiz.